We're told that it's going to take NASA astronauts to the moon and become a transport ship for Martian colonies. The Pentagon wants to use it to deliver military supplies around the world in a matter of minutes. Astronomers and space tourists are taking a big interest in it, and its creator promises that it will drastically reduce the cost of space travel. Today, we're going to tell you all about Elon Musk's Starship, which he calls the Holy Grail of space technology. Prepare for liftoff. Hi everyone, my name's David and I'm the new host of Pro Robots. So in the comments section under the last video, some viewers debated whether I'm an updated version of AI or a real living person. Unfortunately, this has plunged me into some sort of existential crisis to the extent that I'm not even fully sure what the answer to that question is. All I do know is that the data I have been trained on offered no clues, so for now, I'm afraid this question is going to have to go unanswered. Sorry about that. For Musk's private space company, Starship is the future. Its success or failure could determine whether or not the company achieves its dreams. As the next generation of SpaceX's Falcon 9 reusable booster rocket, Starship is being developed as the largest ever and the first fully reusable rocket system that will cost less and fly more often than other comparable rockets. As of 2019, prototype rockets have been showing off their stainless steel exteriors at the South Texas spaceport. After many failures, the Starship prototype didn't actually take off and land successfully for the first time until May of 2021. SM-15 was powered by three Raptor engines, each shutting down sequentially until the rocket reached its apogee, the point of maximum separation from the Earth, which was an altitude of about 10 kilometers. Before refocusing for controlled descent, SN-15 performed a fuel transfer to internal tanks that contained fuel for landing. Active aerodynamic control was achieved by independent movement of two front and two rear flaps on the hull, which are actuated by the onboard computer. This controlled Starship's position during flight and ensured it landed precisely where it was intended. The Raptor engines restarted before landing when the rocket performed the rollover maneuver for landing. All previous explosions and crashes of Starship shouldn't be considered as failures of the company. On the contrary, this is the philosophy of its founder. To fly, to fall, to learn from whatever went wrong, and then to start all over again, armed with these new lessons. So, what exactly is the final working version of Starship? The fully assembled 120-meter Starship is almost 30 meters taller than the Statue of Liberty, and 10 meters taller than the Saturn V rocket that delivered US astronauts to the moon with NASA's Apollo program. Musk said Starship is about twice as powerful as Saturn V and has a takeoff weight of 5,000 tons. Starship is made from rolls of stainless steel with high chromium and nickel content. At first, it was 301 steel, then Musk mentioned that some parts will be made from 304L grade steel, and later said that the company will probably eventually switch to alloys of its own design. Rolls of steel are unrolled, cut, and welded along the edge of the cut to make a cylinder. Each of these cylinders is nine meters in diameter, two meters high, and weighs about 1,600 kilograms. To assemble the Starship hull, 17 of these cylinders and the nose fairing are stacked on top of each other and welded around the edges. Inside the hull are multiple domes separating the liquid methane and oxygen cylinders under high pressure. These domes are made by robots and welded at the rate of one seam every 10 minutes. They are then expected with an X-ray machine. Originally, the Starship shell, like many other rockets, was made of high-tech carbon fiber composites. They're light and durable, but expensive, about $200 per kilogram if you take into account the high percentage of rejects. They're also not super convenient to work with. For example, parts made of such composites must be dried in an autoclave, which is potentially problematic when you're building a rocket with a diameter of 9 meters. At the same time, stainless steel costs $3 per kilogram, and even though it's heavier, 
Its strength allows you to reduce the weight in other parts of the rocket, and it doesn't need to be covered with paint. In general, it's cheap, easy to manufacture, has a high melting point, and is cryogenically heat resistant. The development and construction of the rocket system was clearly visible at SpaceX's outdoor facilities in Boca Chica, Texas, just a few miles from the US-Mexico border. The company calls the area Starbase. Cameras placed nearby, working around the clock, allowed the world to watch this engineering spectacle closely. The top stage of the Starship system, itself a spacecraft, is also called Starship. It's 50 meters high and has a dry mass of 100 tons. By refueling in space, the Starship will be able to deliver people and cargo to high orbits, the Moon, Mars, and other places in the solar system. The spacecraft has two main tanks and two collector tanks, with a total carrying capacity of 1,200 tons. Each tank contains a specific type of fuel, either liquid oxygen or methane, and part of the tanks are reserved for spacecraft rollover and landing. There are six Raptor engines in the bottom of the Starship, three of which operate within the atmosphere, and the other three, the so-called Raptor vacuum engines, can operate in space. The spacecraft has four hull flaps to control speed and drop orientation on landing. Two of the flaps are mounted near the nose fairing and two are mounted near the bottom. The hinges on which they are mounted are metal sealed as they are the most easily damaged during re-entry. The Starship heat shield is designed for repeated use without maintenance between flights. It covers only the portion of the Starship that will feel the full force of re-entry. The shield is made up of thousands of tiles attached to metal studs at a small distance from each other. And this is to account for thermal expansion. The hexagonal shape prevents direct streams of heated gas from forming to avoid its transition into a glowing plasma. All this allows the shield to withstand a temperature of 1,400 degrees Celsius. The Starship has a payload capacity of up to 1,000 cubic meters, much larger than any other spacecraft. The declared payloads of Starship range from 100 to 150 tons, depending on the modification. That being said, a payload of up to 150 tons means that five Starship flights can deliver more cargo into space than the rest of the world managed in 135 rocket launches in 2021. Its upper stage contains more pressurized volume than the International Space Station, which took a decade to build. To reach orbit, the 50-meter Starship is mounted on a 70-meter rocket booster called Super Heavy. Then, at the edge of space, the two parts separate. Starship continues to orbit while the rocket launcher returns to land near the launch pad. Keeping balance during the landing of such a long stage is aided by a massive tower equipped with mechanical arms, which must cause chopsticks. It will try to grab the descending rocket and set it back on the launch pad. And within a couple of hours, Super Heavy should be ready for another takeoff. The launch vehicle is equipped with 33 Raptor engines and its tanks can hold 3,600 tons of fuel, including 2,800 tons of liquid oxygen and 800 tons of liquid methane. Without fuel, Super Heavy's dry mass is estimated at 160 to 200 tons. The booster has four lattice fins, each weighing about three tons which are unevenly spaced to provide more pitch control. They can only rotate on the roll axis and control the descent of the launch vehicle, as well as serving as a mounting point for the mechanical arms of the Mechazilla catching tower. To control orientation, the launch vehicle can fire its cold gas engines. The Mechazilla tower rises 140 meters on the SpaceX launch pad. It consists of sections of steel trusses, a lightning rod on top, and a pair of mechanical arms that can catch and recover the launch vehicle. According to the engineer's idea, the process of girdling the first stage of the Super Heavy rocket will be quite simple. That said, accurate calculations will be required for a successful landing. During the return process, the launch vehicle stage must reduce the rate of fall so that the aerodynamic rudders are able to hook or attach themselves to a special boom. After that, two powerful claws will be able to encircle the body of the stage on both sides so it won't fall. If it achieves the utmost precision, the company will be able to land the first stage so perfectly that, in principle at least, it won't need even the slightest repair. Meanwhile, the Starship will accelerate to orbital speed and enter a circular orbit. There it can be refueled by the Starship tanker modification by docking the two spacecraft with each other. Both then accelerate slightly towards the tanker, using the control engines and injecting fuel into the Starship. The fueled Starship then fires the engines and heads for its destination. 
For landings on non-atmospheric bodies such as the Moon, Starship engages its engines and thrusters to slow down and land. For other bodies with an atmosphere such as Mars, Starship, protected by a heat shield, slows down as it enters the atmosphere. It then performs a landing maneuver. First, the ship falls belly down, spreading out its flaps, and reduces its rate of descent, just like a parachutist. Then, at an altitude of about 500 meters, the ship fires its engines, folds its flaps, and assumes an upright position for landing. The engines that power the Starship, Raptor, have also evolved, and the current version is called Raptor 2. The company has also modified its engine to work in space, calling it the Raptor Vacuum. But these aren't the final versions. According to Musk, for an engine that can really make life multiplanetary, a complete redesign is needed. So you work on the engines that SpaceX continues, and the new version will not be called Raptor. The Starship's Raptor engines, like the entire system, are designed with reusability in mind. They use a sophisticated, high-efficiency design that was first developed in the Soviet Union in the 1960s, but wasn't actually put into practice at that time. Methane was chosen over kerosene because it's cheaper and produces very little soot, which helps keep the interior of the engine clean. Also, both methane and the oxygen needed to burn it can be obtained from the rarefied carbon dioxide atmosphere of Mars. SpaceX hopes that one day it will allow spacecraft headed for Mars to refuel for a return flight to Earth. The entire Raptor family uses a new alloy that can withstand 300 bar pressure inside the main combustion chamber. These engines can be fired multiple times, with their nozzles being cooled by the surrounding moving fuel, a process known as regenerative cooling. In the future, a family of engines could be mass-produced, costing about $230,000 per engine and about $100 per kilonewtons. In the long term, SpaceX plans to create three variants of the Raptor. Engines optimized for atmospheric flight with and without gimbal thrust, and a vacuum-optimized engine without gimbal thrust. Despite its power and larger size, Starship should be cheaper than the Falcon 9 rocket, which currently costs $62 million per launch. Elon Musk says he is fully confident that SpaceX Starship rocket launches will cost less than $10 million within two to three years, and later will drop to $2 million per launch. Created as the basis of a transportation system for Martian colonies, Today, Starship has many potential uses. Firstly, as a cargo ship for the delivery of large payloads into space. These could be large shipments of satellites, telescopes larger than the James Webb, or, for example, a full-size drill to explore the Martian soil instead of the tiny drill of the Perseverance rover. In this case, Starship could have a large door replacing the usual payload fairings. It would be closed during launch, open to release the payload after orbit, and closed again on re-entry. The payloads can be integrated into a vertical rocket inside ISO 8 class temperature controlled clean air. The second version is a tanker for refueling ships that will take people or cargo anywhere in the solar system. SpaceX recently showed a simulation of the docking of the tanker and Starship. At the same time, Musk claims that docking their own spaceships with each other will be much easier than, for example, docking them to the International Space Station. The crewed version could be adopted for flights to the Moon, Mars, point-to-point -point flights, and other destinations. Each spacecraft can carry 100 people with, and I quote, private cabins, large public spaces, centralized storage, solar storm shelters, and an observation gallery. Starship's life support system is expected to be closed, meaning that all resources in it will be constantly recycled. The lunar version of the Starship will have no wings or heat shields, and this is to reduce weight, and it will use small engines for landing because of the risk of dust and cratering when landing on Raptor engines. The six engines will be located at the top of the ship's hull, a design similar to NASA's Langley Hercules concept. It will also have two redundant airlocks. And needless to say, the US military has its own views on the Starship. In January, the Air Force, gave SpaceX $102 million to study the use of a spacecraft as a cargo ship that could deliver military and humanitarian supplies to various parts of the world within minutes. However, the legality and logistics of such a concept remain uncertain. Perhaps the most tempting application for Starship is access to outer planets, which historically have been difficult to send missions to. 
In recent years, the water moons of Saturn and Jupiter have overtaken Mars as the most promising places to look for alien life. Scientists are already developing plans to use Starship to explore Neptune, which has only been visited once before. That was back in 1989 when the US probe Voyager 2 flew past, eventually leaving the solar system altogether. Starship's first flight took place on April the 20th, and the launch was deemed a success, though this only applies to the fact that the rocket was able to take off and didn't immediately explode on liftoff. After taking off, Starship was able to climb to an altitude of about 40 kilometers, but because it lost control of its engines, engineers launched a self-destruct and the system exploded before the first stage had even been detached. At the same time, it turned out that the concrete structures of the launch pad could not withstand the standard load of the takeoff, and they collapsed. As a result, the crater was 20 meters in diameter and all nearby infrastructure was damaged by concrete shrapnel. But that's not all. Dirt and debris rained down over an area of 10 kilometers from the launch site, damaging the environment and the homes of Port Isabel residents. Because of this, regulators revoked SpaceX's permission to fly. And if the company has time to fix the destruction at the launch pad and fix the problems in the rocket, it should take about one or two months, as promised by Elon Musk. It may take much longer to get a new permit, but in any case, there appears to be no doubt the Starship will eventually fly. And it's probably going to change the whole space industry. What about you? Do you believe in the success of Starship? Feel free to write in the comments, subscribe to the channel, and give this video a like. I've been David, a simple earthling, a living person. I'll see you in the next video.